welcome to All Over Again podcast. It's so good to see you. So good to see you and be here in person. Thank you for joining me. Of course. So, Laura, describe yourself in three adjectives. Oh, gosh. (laughs) Way to put you on the spot, right? So, I would say I'm funny and positive and generally pretty happy. That was five, sorry. That's cool. Okay. It's all good. And I would agree. I would, I have always thought you to be very sunny and happy and have, have always have a very good outlook on all the things. In fact, that's what I noticed most about you when I first met you. I met Thanks. you at um, Carrie Glassman's masterclass for Nutritious Life Studio. That's right. And it was before COVID. Oh, I know. And like, there's another one coming before. up in October, but I can't go. I know. I can't go either. And I'm very disappointed. Me too. I've already sent a text to Carrie. I know. And I'm begging. I'm like, when's the event going to be in New York City? Like, it has to happen I know. soon. Well, we can always just do something here. I know. We don't have to wait longer. I know. But how do we convince Carrie? Like, she we can have a reunion? She's the best. I know. She really is. She's <laughs> <The> amazing. <best. laughs> Actually, Carrie's like really impacted your life in a lot of ways, right? She supported you in writing the book that you wrote on She had a nice smoothies. pet talk with me before I did that. Right. She's just such a great mentor. Yeah, she really is. She's like the OG. She really in is. In the dietitian community. Yeah. And all of wellness. Remind me the name of your book. So my book is Slim Down with Smoothies. I wrote it a few years ago. It is 100 smoothie recipes. And it was just really fun because I'm a dietitian. I went into the field, oh gosh, 20 years ago already. I'm not that old, but I went, (laughs) I have a bachelor's in nutrition. So unlike most dietitians, I started at 18 in college um, with a bachelor's in nutrition, which was rare at the time. There weren't that many programs. Um, So it all started because I really loved food. I didn't come from an eating disorder background or, you know, a traumatic background like a lot of people in our field have. I came from just a simple love of food and wellness and helping people. And it's the same now. And that's why when um, this publisher asked me to write a smoothie book, I was like, oh, my God, that totally aligns with what I love and why I'm in this field. And I took a pen to paper one night and I wrote a hundred ideas in one night. Wow. And I had to adjust some, obviously, because I had to test them all. (laughs) But it just comes out of my brain. That's what comes easily to me. Has it always, have you always been into food? Always. Really? And it's funny because my parents weren't foodies. They kind of were just kind of meat and potatoes type of people and junk food. You know, we'll talk about our dads, but my dad was just like a kid. He was the biggest junk food eater. And I always thought, how did I come from this? And and maybe that's why I went into it because I didn't, you know, I had an interest in feeling better and looking better and just being healthier and helping other people. Did you know that there was a correlation back then between eating well the right way and losing weight? Or were you just sort of making, what was the correlation? I don't really know. I just, I really started reading. Remember we used to read all those health magazines? Yes. I think that's where it started. I was thinking back to like, where did I, how did I get interested in this? And I was reading like health magazine or like shape. Are you an athlete too? Not really, but people always asked me if I was an athlete. Well, because my friends that were athletes really loved like shape and self and women's health mag where I was like, oh, I'm going to, you know, read Allure or Vogue or Cosmo. Mm -hmm. I mean, those were I read them too. Yeah. But those magazines just really got me interested in it. And I always worked out. I was always into fitness. So that's maybe where it came from also. Mm. Um, And I always had to, you know, like be aware of staying healthy because I wasn't one of those people that could just not do anything and stay in a healthy place. You know, like, just, like, stay naturally thin. I wasn't one of those people. I had to, like, I've had to work at it because I love food so much. 
By the way, that changes for all of us at some I know. point. But I felt lucky. And you, I tell my clients this who are teenagers when they're like, it's not fair. I have these friends that don't have to worry at all about what they eat and they're like stick figures. And I tell them, I know you're, you might disagree with me now, but you're actually lucky that you have to learn and pay attention now because as you get older, that's when you're not going to struggle as much because you've had to learn from a young age. Exactly. So because I, I turn it around. No, but it's true. true. Yeah. Because one day it will become harder. I was mm-hmm. that person. I was that person that I could eat anything, but because of it, I was so unhealthy. Mm-hmm. In fact, that's what inspired me to get my credentials you know, through Carrie yeah. and understand what nutrition was all about because I had grown up with this idea of, you know, this, this tiered, what is it? The, the food pyramid and there's five oh parts gosh. of the food pyramid and, which is know, like really not very helpful. This food not pyramid. At all. No. Is it still Silly. in existence? It is, but they're trying to change it. I mean, they've they changed it a little rid of it. It's just, it's more confusing to people than ever, like in general. Just wellness. But do you believe that the pyramid is actually sort of in part because of the special interest groups that sure. are involved in supporting government? Yeah, I think a lot of our... Like dairy meat, etc. Nutrition labels and the way that things are marketed come from the big companies that are supporting the politicians. Yeah, I think that's one of the biggest problems is just... Our food supply, yeah, the way it's marketed, especially to kids. Oh, it's so scary. It's so scary. It I was. talk about that a lot online. That's really important. Like you walk into you. a supermarket and it just looks like a candy store, but it's like boxes of cereal. It's gross. And there's healthy words on the front and that's what we see first. So then parents buy it. And I grew up in a house like that with like 20 different boxes of cereal and my dad would pile them up. <laughs> like dinner would for him would be like 10 cereals in a giant bowl. For real? Yeah. Wow. Like up until the day he died. Wow. That yeah. was his thing. Yeah. It's amazing. I know there's this misnomer that the word natural for some reason means like good for you. Mm-hmm. And that's just a marketing word. It's it, all it's marketing. So it's mind blowing. All of it. Yeah. But it brings me back to that point where I thought, okay, I need to learn about nutrition Mm -hmm. because I'm type A and I need to be able to control something in Mm -hmm. this moment or experience of uncontrollable when I was trying to expand my family. Mm -hmm. And that's when I thought, okay, there's nothing I can do, but I can control what I, you know, put on my skin and what I put into my body. Mm -hmm. And so that's how I met you is because I became sort of fascinated with this whole idea of food, not just because it tastes good, but how to nourish my body, feel good and have it taste good at the same time. And I think that there's this also this misnomer that people think that if it's really good for you, it's not going to taste good. That's right. But you start to prefer to eat more nutritious foods because they make you feel better. And then, you know, you're getting healthier from the inside out. Yeah. So that's another thing. Someone can appear really healthy on the outside, but inside. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. And it, and it can wreak havoc on mm-hmm. your body, too, from a health perspective, right? Because yeah. you can't see that. And then you go on the medicine train and Western medicine, which treats symptoms, not mm-hmm. the cause. And exactly. I think that the medical community is slowly starting to identify this. But everybody's so caught up and obsessed with the gold standard, yeah. and they're looking at studies that are outdated, 10, 15 years old. Well, we so wait outdated. until people get sick, or we wait until there's a problem. Yeah. But we're not, there's no preventative medicine in this country. Like, one of the reasons most dietitians don't even accept insurance is because insurance companies do not reimburse us. Be, and that is like such a great example of the fact that there's nothing being done to prevent people from getting sick. And then, you know, you wait until somebody gets diabetes and then it's almost too late. Sure. And it, and you could, you know, pick any, you know, ailment or chronic disease. And even fertility, I know that you talk so much. I mean, that's one of your biggest missions. Yeah. But just nourishing yourself from the inside out can, of course, improve your 
chances of conceiving. It's so true. Which it really can. And you can feel better than you might have already felt because the medicine just wreaks such havoc on your body. Yeah. And I think people underestimate how rough the medicine is and that good food can actually help it even just a little bit. And that is something. And recovery. Mm-hmm. The recovery mm-hmm. part is huge because yeah. there's recovery and it it takes time to get all that medicine out of your body. So I digress because we can talk about nutrition all like day long. Years. And I do have one quick question about smoothies. Can you really yeah. slim down on smoothies alone? <laughs> like do do you believe that? Well, you know, weight loss is not the whole the title, first of all, was not my idea. Okay. I actually fought with them a little bit and made them <laughs> insert the words and good health. Because it <laughs> says like it says like slim down with smoothies for weight loss. And then I made them add and good health because we put too much focus on weight loss. It's really not about weight loss, but that is what we're obsessed with in this country. If we take the focus off of it and look at it as a byproduct of getting healthier, you know, someone's going to naturally shed excess weight if they need to, if they're changing other things about their life. So I just want to say that first. Okay. (laughs) I'm not one of these anti-weight loss dietitians at all. I believe that like if you're uncomfortable in your weight and, and you, you know, you have excess weight to lose, it is of course going to help you get healthier. But we put all our eggs in one basket, like focusing on weight loss. Cause my clients call me and say, I want to lose weight. Yeah. And we kind of do everything else that then produces weight loss naturally. And that is the way you're going to sustainably lose weight and stay in a good, healthy place. So wait, the question was, can you slim down with smoothies? You can slim down with anything you're eating. But healthfully, but healthfully. Yes, can you of do course. It? So okay. a smoothie is just I just made a smoothie the other day that I called the everything smoothie. I think that's one in my book. I forget what they're even called at this point. <laughs> there's so many. Well, there's a hundred. Yeah, there's a hundred, yeah. right? And I just take everything that I think is nutritious in my house and throw it in a blender and things that I wouldn't eat on their own, which is what's great about a smoothie. You can get them into your diet by blending them up and making it taste really good in this sweet shake that's very filling and yummy. So yes, of course you can slim down with smoothies, but you can't drink them all day long. I would recommend having like one or maybe two a day. Okay, that's like where I was a going. Is there something snack? that I'm not like seeing here? Yeah. Like should so the I be original on a, pitch a of the book smoothie? was a little bit it, it felt a little slim fasty to me where it's okay. like three shakes a day and a sensible dinner and I was like, "Uh uh-uh, uh, that is not realistic for 99.9% of people." Sure. You can have, you know, one or two a day. That would be a great addition to your diet and help incorporate all these additional nutrients that you might not be getting, like more fruits and vegetables, which is lacking in all of our diets. Um, but to have them all day long is just it's kind of silly. So yes, you can slim down with smoothies and you can just create a healthier diet by adding all these things you might not be having. And so the key here would be to slim down with smoothies, but reach out to Laura about a meal plan to help build around the smoothies. Exactly. Got it. Yes. And I talk about that in the book too. The first four chapters are just have nothing to really do with smoothies. It's more about like how I educate my clients about just changing their life. So the book is fully encompassing. I love it. Yes. Wonderful. (laughs) So we talked a little bit about you growing up in a household where it was not all that healthy in terms of um, diet. And when I say diet, some people are like, diet means losing weight. That's right. another misnomer. Yeah. I mean, diet as far as like what you eat to exactly. sustain your life. A diet means life. what you eat. Yes, exactly. So you grew up in a household where food was more of an energy source rather than a basis of nutrition. Is that correct? Yes, but also we did have dinner together most of the nights. My mom always cooked. So it's like social. Yeah, so it was like, and I think we need to bring that back into our homes. <laughs> I think life I is so chaotic now, especially these days that like families aren't having dinner together anymore. People yeah. are eating at all different times. Yeah. And I'm guilty of it too. My kids have a million sports and one's home at one time, one's home at later. But it was almost like, 
we didn't put such an emphasis on food at all. It was just like the same rotating meals. (laughs) And it was okay. I think I just wanted more. I was like, I love food. I want to explore more. And I think that has to do with my entire life. Like I wanted to kind of branch out in a lot of different ways in my life, which I'm still trying to do from my childhood. As we know, so much stems from our childhood, right? (laughs) So much stems from our childhood. So knowing what you know now and looking back, is there anything that you would do all over again if you had the chance to rewind it? Well, I do believe after, especially after going through a traumatic year, which we'll talk about because we that's what brought us together again. Let's talk about unfortunately, it now. Unfortunately. Unfortunately, because we're together now. But I really learned to like live in the present, like take each day and one path leads to another. And I don't really think we can look back and say, I wish I did this or that because I'm right here where I am right now because of my choices and where I was in my life. So I, I really can't say I would change anything big. Um, I feel really grateful and fortunate every day that I have my kids and my family and like life today in this moment is good. So that's, I'll take that because it's a lot better than last summer. (laughs) Sure. And last summer was hard and both of us actually lost our dad's within, I think, days of each other last what year. Was your day? My dad passed on September 28th. And I was September 29th. And that is uncanny. I have and, the chills. And they both passed of the same thing. The which, same disease. Which was brain cancer, a glioblastoma, yes? Mm-hmm. Um, which was re- extremely hard. And, and I went through my period of, of bargaining. <clears throat> there were a lot of things that I wish I would have done differently in hindsight. And I've worked a lot with mental health professionals, therapists, Mm -hmm. and some alternatives too, right? Some, you know, traumatic energy healing specialists. Me too. I have a a spiritual healer. healer. Yes, right? Who's like better than a, you know, licensed therapist or For different things. For different things, right? You need different things. It's more about a connection with somebody. Yes, that's definitely a part of it too. And um, I think the part that helped me with a traditional therapist was like talking to somebody and validating that I didn't fuck up as hugely as I thought I did while I was bargaining out all of the different things. Like I should have, could have, would have, right? Like if I just done this one thing, would it have changed the outcome? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that is something that really changed the whole construct of, what I would do all over again, because I had come up with this idea of doing this podcast all over again before I was even aware of my father's illness or his Mm. diagnosis. But I put it on hold because I needed to make that my priority and supporting him. So to that end, I look at the name of all over again and I think, wow, there were things, sure, I would have done all over again that I've healed through. And this is my most current situation that I'm thinking, okay, that is my all over again that I'm healing through. So I think a lot in the bargaining, it still pops up sometime. It's not as as harsh as it was. I mean, I really beat myself up mm-hmm. thinking I could have changed outcomes on things or at least extended my father's life because it happened so or did things differently so that I wouldn't be where I am today dealing with some very hard and sort of grueling things, you know. So you tell me, like, is there anything in hindsight looking back or do you feel pretty comfortable? Have you made it through your bargaining? You know, I was with him at the end, which was really traumatic, but like really beautiful in a way because you can't always get that time. You know, some people go like, you know, in an instant. Sure. So we had that time, but he wasn't him anymore, but he still knew we were, that I was there and like our energy was connected. Like I could feel that and like I got to hold his hand and like, I mean, like just thinking about, like I almost try to push it out of my head because that's all I thought about. 
for so long after he passed away. But now I'm trying to think of it as like, I'm grateful I had that time because I was there. But I mean, it's all just so hard. There's again, there's nothing I really regret except for the fact that like, I wish he didn't have to. And it was just like you. I mean, yours was really quick with your dad and quicker than mine. It was like four and a half months from diagnosis, um, which is really quick, but it felt like, you know, you're like walking through sand because it was like every day was so intense. I was like, what's happening now? And, um, but I don't think that the outcome would be any different. I just think even though it was four months, he suffered a little too long because he wouldn't have wanted anyone to see him like this. And, to have not like he ended he didn't pass away at home he had to be in like a it was like a hospice sort mm-hmm. of center um but they were really amazing the hospice team that's great they really made him feel comfortable and um and i still like i'm in disbelief of all of it i still like don't believe it really happened like i was just with my mom last week and we were down at the beach in, in New Jersey because I'm from New Jersey originally. And, I, like, it's just – I think he's going to walk in at any moment. It's the weirdest thing. And and before the age of 42, nothing bad had ever happened to me in my life. Like, thank God. But it's just – you just can't believe it until you're going through it. Right? I, yeah. But in it all, I think in my case it happened so fast. I didn't have time – I don't know if one ever has truly time, but I, I certainly didn't process it. I was gearing up for the big fight yeah. to prolong my dad's life. I mean, my dad was in it with me and he was um, from diagnosis to passing. It was almost exactly one month. My God. And so we were gearing up to fight it out to prolong. And my dad was more lucid than he wasn't. Mm -hmm. And he was very good at masking when he wasn't lucid, which is part of, I think, the reason why it took so long to get to diagnosis. Mm -hmm. My dad was a doctor by trade. He was a surgeon by trade and knew exactly what to say. Right. And he knew exactly what medicine to take when he wasn't feeling well or he had a headache or his body didn't feel quite right. And he also had some back issues from having, you know, he had a slip disc from falling with his um, his 88-pound Weimariner on a walk, like, oh you know, over a decade before. And so a lot of what we were putting the health emphasis on for my dad was really his back, you know, and right. thinking that, oh, my gosh, you know, he's having some issues. There was a seizure situation, and we really just thought that perhaps there was just too many um, – medicines, you know, that were interacting Mm -hmm. and maybe that was the root issue. And that was not, I mean, even the hospital thought that. Yeah. And partially that's my fault too, because I'm having the conversations with them, at least during the discharge and having the conversations of what to do next and what happened. And it's like a full-time job, right? When somebody gets sick. It was a full-time job. And so it was hard not knowing if it was ever going to get better, and it didn't, and but I really thought it would. this is the type of would. diagnosis, just for anyone listening, that is like, you know, it's a death sentence. There's a 2% or so success rate. Although what's really fascinating is that there is a, a new vaccine that is is currently being evaluated by the FDA for approval that was stemmed from a clinical trial at UCLA that actually my friend underwent and it's a neuropeptide style vaccine that mixed with cells from the actual tumor creates a personalized almost vaccine for your body that in many cases, if you know, caught early enough, it can actually reduce the size of the tumor and prolong life. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying that it's perfect, um, but my friend Jamil, who has also been on the show, 
was 32 when he was diagnosed with the same thing as our dad's oh, and he's now 43. Wow. Yes. Right. You hear like very rare cases. Very like rare. This. But, but this is. And I'm like is, a little pessimistic about it of because course it's like, you, are. you know, this, the doctors are like, so they like give you so much hope, but like, you know, but you have to live on hope, right? You have to. I and mean, that's what we were doing. And that's why I can't say, I wish we didn't do, you know, do the surgery and the treatment. By the way, the treatments haven't changed in like 30 years. They've really not found much, <laughs> you know, there's really not much advancement in this disease. Um, the standard of care. You are standard so of care. right. The standard of care is predominantly, um, it's surgery, chemo. radiation, and oral chemo. Right. And so in, 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 in a lot of cases, not even the oral chemo, the right. real chemo, yeah. um, my dad was doing a combination of infusions and um, an oral chemo. And he was working with sort of a maverick in the, the space. And that's how we knew about the vaccine trial. And my dad was going to do the vaccine trial yeah. in Tijuana, of all places. It, it it was it started at UCLA, and then it was at Dana Farber, and then they did a clinical trial some other places, I believe. But then they were doing it in Tijuana, and that was the closest in Southern California to where right. we were. So yeah. that was going to make sense. And my dad was all about it. We, I mean. In retrospect, my dad was getting so much weaker. I just didn't see it mm -hmm. and I didn't want to believe it. Yeah. And my mom, my parents were no longer together. They were just very close friends, which was a heaven sent mm -hmm. truly. She kept telling me, you have to prepare. You have to start thinking about these things. Like, and, and my grandfather passed of a different type of, but also brain cancer, which is also wow. kind of a scary thing. And, yeah. Um, because then you start to think of like, well, maybe we, this should be a part of like general health sort of checkup, mm -hmm. right? Overall body. Yeah, I think it's like more common than we think. I think it is more common you because you start hear about hearing it. about all of these. Right. I mean, when people. I shared what I shared about my dad, you told me, and there were at least, I don't know, two or three other people that I know mm -hmm. that saw my post and said, wow, you know, my parent recently passed of that same thing. Yeah. And I thought, wow, this can't be that, this can't be that common, but it, it might be. Yeah. And it's scary because I think that it's one of the least funded. It is. You know, mm -hmm. sort of cancers out there mm -hmm. because there's not a cure for it. Right. There's no cure. And, and it's, it's so just, expensive. Yeah. Right. And like, um, I know we talked about this on the phone, but like, you know, our, I think both of our dads masked what was really going on for a long time. I too think long. Too long. I think the same in my dad's case. You know, dads are supposed to kind of be the strong warriors. Yeah. And they don't want you to know that anything's wrong with them. Sure. So I think for, you know, in our cases, that's what what happened. Because when they found my – not that if they found it earlier, I, I still think the same outcome would have happened. But, you know, when they diagnosed him, it was like so far along. Me, me too. And you know, finding that out way right? before I think he told anybody. So, but I also wonder, and I do wonder, do they know, right? Because when you're having symptoms and then you're becoming a little more forgetful, right? right. Yeah, that was part of it, right? And then it, 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 but at first it was confusing to me. Mm -hmm. First, I thought it was. The medicine, because it was like, okay, we're, we would have a discussion one day and, and I would say, okay, dad, I've done some research. Here are four or five neurologists that I think we should go see when I'm in town soon. And my dad would say, okay, send them to me. I will have a look, I promise. And we'll go together. And then three days later, I'd say, okay, did you have a chance to look at the list? What do you think? It's going to take a while, perhaps, you know, and, and my dad would say, well, first of all, I'm a physician. We get physician privileges. And secondly, I I don't know what you're talking about. I am not going to see a doctor. I am perfectly fine. Mm -hmm. And I was just so confused. And it would make me so mad at first because I was like, I am trying so hard. And you're telling me and I'm doing all this extra work They're that stubborn. I'm happy to do. And I was, <laughs> I was thinking, oh, my gosh, my dad is being so stubborn. Yeah. It was so beyond his control. Right. And, and that was part of it later, too. Yeah. I felt so bad about because, I mean, I would, I was like, you know, we, we were getting into these like 
stubborn fits, you know, of yeah. you have to do and no, I won't. And, and then a couple of days later, I'd have the same conversation. It'd be like, okay. And it was just very confusing. Mm-hmm. But now it, it made sense when the diagnosis mm-hmm. happened. Yeah. And there's just so much going on. It's so confusing, right? So That's confusing. why it's like, I, I realize people really need like patient advocates, like for the family. Yes. Because no one knows anything. You don't know what to do. You don't know who to call. And like, we're so fortunate that we, like, I have doctors in the family, but we were still, you know, felt like hopeless sometimes. Like, where do we go? What do we do? What do, what choice do we make? And there are so many people that have to go through these terrible diagnoses without any knowledge and without any help and sometimes without even any insurance or ways to pay for it. Right. So, you know, part of me, like, I always try my hardest to turn things around. Like, where is the light in the dark? Because there's so much dark in this life right now, but there's so much light also. And I would think, okay, we're, we're so fortunate that for these reasons that we have these resources, but most people don't. What was your light in the dark? Well, it's for, with my dad. Yeah. Well, that I got to like say goodbye to him. I got to ask him things, um, that like both my parents were retired when it happened. It's not like they had to lose their jobs. Like these are things I thought about, mm. like just financially that like they had great insurance that he had great, you know, he was in a good treatment center, um, things like that. Just that like, you know, he, he saw me through like the, you know, get married and have and knew my children things, you know, that some people don't get that. Absolutely. In looking back, did you have any bargaining? Yeah, I still do. I think to myself, why did I be, why did he even go through treatment? It, it kind of, it just cut off any quality of life, like right after the, the surgery. When you say treatment, do you mean the surgery or the treatment itself? The surgery really, which from diagnosis to surgery was like a week. It was really fast. Like, wow. they wanted to get him in. They wanted to do the same for my dad. He he refused. He refused to do yeah. the surgery. He just kind of – my dad had – he he had given up bargaining on himself. He, he was very much like, okay, this is what it is. He said to me, this is going to happen to everyone. You just don't know how or when. So he was okay with it all. He If he had the choice, he wouldn't have gone through any of it. And – this is something I talk about with my mom a lot. She's like, should we have done these things? But, you know, the doctors and the, and Western medicine pushes it yes. because they want to do whatever they can. But I think in his case, none of like the, the surgery and the treatment, the chemo and radiation just didn't give him any quality of life. So would he have had more quality of life if he didn't have the surgery? Probably. Even if it was like a couple of weeks. You know, he would have still been him, I think. Mm -hmm. But the surgery, when they take a piece of your brain out. Changes you. Yeah, he was, that was it instantly. He was a different person in different ways. He declined really quickly. He became like cachectic, which is like when you're, you just lose a ton of weight, even if you're eating, because, you know, your just body's battling so much stress. Oh, that's so So many things happen, like very quickly. And it was like, I'd worked in hospitals over 10 years. Like I used to work in ICUs in New York city, which we are in right now. (laughs) Um, and I couldn't believe that like roles were reversed. Like I was now with the patient was my dad. Yeah. And I'm not the clinician anymore. Like I'm the family that's being treated. So it's like, I couldn't believe it at times. Like I was trying to find him, you know, protein powders to put into smoothies and like ways to help him get nutrition in and gain weight because, you know, that's a factor too when you, and I think ultimately that's what happened. That's why at, he didn't die from, the, you know, at the end, he didn't die from the tumors. He died from just becoming so weak and not ha- and having no nutrition for weeks. Um, and that's really, you know, what happened. It's, it's really just hard. crazy. You're just like, is this my life? Like, is this my story? I can't believe it. 
Right. I still think that. Is it their story, you know? Yeah. And that's really hard. Yeah. It's extremely hard. I mean, I, I thought once again, like, okay, nutrition is going to be such a part of this. I found actually, um, a dietitian out of Texas named Patrice Surley. She's phenomenal. And this is what she focuses on. Mm -hmm. And we did, my dad was such a good sport about it. We did a, um, zoom session with her and she gave such great insight into, you know, how to support brain health. And we were really, this was all part of the plan, but we really just gotten started. Right. I mean, we really didn't have time. We didn't have time. I mean, I, this is why preventative medicine, not that, you know, for the disease we had to endure with our dads, they say there's nothing you can do to prevent this, but I don't know if I fully believe that. I think again, it's like, full holistic whole body preventative health is going to prevent anything from happening quicker and we don't have any of that no it's true i mean my dad ate well in terms of he loved fruits and vegetables and he loved food he loved food so i don't know that his diet was always balanced Mm -hmm. but he loved like fruits, vegetables, and kefir. Kefir was like his thing, Uh you know? So he's definitely Um, eating much healthier than my dad. (laughs) But but he loved these foods, and it's interesting. These are the foods I love. (laughs) And 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 he loved to cook. I mean, he wasn't always like the best cook in the world, but he loved to cook, and he, I think, putting himself through medical school um, in the early days in England, he would, I think he got a job as a cook. So my dad brought that here, with him and so again he loved to cook i wouldn't say it was always like gourmet or close to it but it was really sweet and he loved to do that my point is he enjoyed food Mm -hmm. um you know his wife not my mom like has the worst diet ever but i think as my dad became more unwell um there was a lot more processed food involved and crappy Mm -hmm. food involved and then she was gone a lot, yeah. but then when she was there, that was that posed its own set of issue. Yes. But um, I digress. I have a lot of anger still yeah. that I'm working yeah. through on that end, and and I'm sure I'll get there. But that's yeah. that's part of that's part of my my bargaining. Well, there's so many different characters in these stories, right? So many characters. When, like, you're going through a family crisis, yes, and it's just like you know everyone's handling it differently, right? And it, you can get angry and you can get all these emotions and then you look back and you start to like understand maybe why someone acted a certain way or um, maybe they couldn't handle it in the moment or, you know, people just handle things differently or like you just kind of, you almost like, I feel like I almost at times blacked out and just like handled it and was yeah. just there in the moment and present. Yes. And then it was like over because I knew it was going to be over. Like, I knew that. I wasn't ready for that. I wasn't there yet. And you're also being gracious because I think you're – every situation is different. And your dad was surrounded with love. And I Mm -hmm. I believe my dad was surrounded with love. Are there so many, like, emotions that you've never experienced? Mm -hmm. And your body's in, like, full, complete stress mode. And, like, so many physical things start to happen from that. I, I found manifestations from the physical being is so true. I mean, I believe, I truly believe that if, if you don't get, take care of your mental health, it manifests. Yeah. Physically. Physically. Yeah. Totally. I was getting sick. It's mind and body. Yeah. I mean, it's crazy. I've never felt like that in my entire life. Why should I? Right. Like, it was, you're going through a, traumatic situation yeah, and your body is reacting and you're no matter how much therapy you're in, how much work you're doing, the physical stuff is still going to happen. You know, like I talk a lot about like losing your appetite um, or the opposite. Some people, you know, emotionally eat because, you know, obviously this is my field. Did you emotionally eat or did you not? I lost my appetite Okay, because it was like, it's like that really deep traumatic terrible stuff is the only time in my life I've lost my appetite. Um, 
otherwise it's the opposite. It's like, like when he passed away, then it was more emotional eating. So it was just like, you know, something to do. It was like an activity to take my mind off things, I think. But when we were, we were going through it, I think, and it happened to my mom too. I mean, she lost too much weight and it just happened. It was like, and I tell my clients who tell me, um, I wish I lost my appetite. I wish I could lose my appetite. I tell them, don't ever wish your appetite away. It's a sign of being healthy. Because think of the times in your life you've lost your appetite. They were probably the worst times in your life. And when you're sick, right? Because yeah. Because when you are sick, yeah, physically or otherwise, mentally, right. then you lose your appetite. Mm-hmm. It's so true. Yeah. I mean, when you're when you have an appetite, you're probably it's, it's a body. It's a your body signal that it's functioning normally for the right. most part. But I also wonder when people, you know, go the other direction, right? It's nerves and other things, yeah. right? So I guess it just depends on your personality it type. It totally depends or it depends on like the timeline of where you are in the situation. In the madness of it? Yeah. Or it's, it's like you just – it's hard to take care of yourself when you're taking care of someone else. Your mind's so preoccupied. How did you take care of yourself and your family during all of this? Well, so – I I was driving a lot because my parents lived about two and a half hours away. So I was just back and forth driving at weird times. You know, people, my, my village, I call them at home. My mom village helped take care of my kids and really my husband too. He's a doctor. So he couldn't really come with me that much because he was on call and he was transitioning in a new job at the time. So he couldn't physically be there for me that much and it wasn't his fault it was just like he had to be home with the kids and they have activities and um so like the way I would take care of myself was through boxing actually (laughs) I'm still boxing so that was a community I would go to so every time I'd come back home from driving hours and just not even remembering the drives like I'd just be crying the whole time I have to pull over at a rest stop and like take a lot of deep breaths it was just, it was a lot, uh, as I'm sure you know. Oh, it's uh, overwhelming. It's really overwhelming. And like your body just takes over. It's like the panic, it just comes out of nowhere or anxiety, just of the unknown. Constant. Yeah. And also, when will it be? When right? are we going to experience? Like, I was just, it was like we started mourning on day one. That was part of what this disease is. It was for us, my family. Um, you know, we knew what was going to happen. We just didn't know how long it would be, but we knew what the outcome was. It wasn't like a different disease where we knew, okay, we have a great, you know, um, success rate or we can treat it or this was like kind of a known. It it's amazing c- that you were able to sort of harness that so quickly. I think my dad was so hopeful and him being a doctor and being so hopeful mm-hmm. and so like not ready. Yeah. And I like drank that Kool-Aid and I was on board with it. And I think I helped sort of like diffuse that Kool-Aid throughout our family because uh-huh. I was sort of, you know, you had to, <laughs> right. And so I didn't deal by the way with the other stuff that yeah. I, I should have. Cause I was so focused on the health part. I just, we were trying to make it to the spring. So my dad would have his lusts and that's what I was focused on. I was not focused on the finances. Like my mom told me that I needed to start thinking about, Uh uh, which are a complete like disaster. Paralyzed in these moments. Or, or like so streamlined focus. Like this is my checklist of these are the things I have to Uh do today. And they become such a strange list of things. Like, Calling the nutritionist, I have to order the, you know, the probiotic. I have to make sure that I am, you know, doing this, that, and the other. And I have to make sure that I am setting up occupational therapy. And, you know, like all the things that you think about in the moment that you've never had to think about. Mm -hmm. And also finding those resources are not always the easiest things either. So it's like starting all over again. Yeah. Literally. And you're just like, what do you do? It's like you're like a baby again. And you you have to learn something you don't know. And it's life or death. Right. That's right. And some of the decisions that we're making are literally life or death. Like, does my dad do the surgery? In which case, you know, he elected, you know, not to. And I had to respect that. We really pushed for him to get a biopsy, which, you know, sure, that became part of the bargaining too. Like, could that have been the reason one month later, why he had a brain bleed. We won't ever know, right? But he had an amazing neurosurgeon that did the operation and sec- or the procedure. And secondly, 
the uh, the world class oncologists that worked with us wouldn't have had all of the information that he would have needed to proceed with a treatment plan right. without the biopsy. So we really pushed for that, even though he didn't want that. Mm-hmm. But the doctor wouldn't have treated him, so our hands were tied. So it it didn't affect him in the sense of like he was still as himself. Right. But we do wonder if there was something later on. You you never know, you and never that's know. what's so it's crazy like, about you this. You almost have to like let it go because there's How nothing you, let you it can go, change though. at this point. I know letting it go is almost impossible. Letting it go and moving forward, like that's what I'm trying to do right now, and that's why you know I'm focusing on like what is happening right now, like what's good in in the present. So what's good in your present? (laughs) Let's talk about what's good in your present. My kids are at sleepaway camp. (laughs) Wow. That's really good. Like you're, it's like, it's so great. Party at your house. Well, not really. We're going to sleep at nine (laughs) o'clock anyway. We're like not partying too much, but just like resting, (gasps) not having to be an Uber driver. change when we get older. Yeah. It's like, I don't want to party that much. I want to, Go to. I want to watch a show and go to bed. But isn't that considered a party sometimes? <laughs> it is. It's the greatest thing ever. Yeah? I'm like, yes, we don't have to do anything tonight. We can just like lay around. Netflix and chill. Yeah. So my kids are really happy. They're in camp. They don't have technology for seven weeks. Just what is better than that in this day and age? So true. Um, and today everybody's healthy. That's what I'm just saying. Today everything's okay because that's all you can do. And you're very focused on a healthful diet for your children. Well, <laughs> I do the best I can like any other mom. But they're old enough now where like they know enough. you can't control that much of what they do. And they're not home a lot. So you 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 can just control what you can in the house. Keep like trying to feed them healthy meals when they're at home. Trying to like put out fruits and vegetables and just kind of. Hope for the best. Yeah. (laughs) And just hoping that like through osmosis, they'll eventually do better. They will because you've educated them. Yeah. And they know. They like to rebel against what you tell them. So they know what I do. So I think part of what my daughter does is she doesn't want to do what I do because she's a teenager. But eventually we want to take care of ourselves and look good and feel good. So I have hope that they will turn things around. And she has an entire book of smoothies. If she ever feels like having smoothies exactly. is part of her. Well, my son tried most of diet. them. He was my taste tester. Oh, sweet. He was only like six or seven at the time. Now that I think about it, he's 10 now. Um, but he loves smoothies. <laughs> my daughter loves smoothies. Yeah. So I feel like your book so is good, good for, for all ages. It is. Forget slimming down with it. Just all of sustaining. my smoothies are named after people, places, and things in my life too, gosh. which is fun. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Next time you write a book. Can you include me? I want to be named. I want a smoothie to be named after me, please. Do you have any parting thoughts for our guests before we sign off for the day? Do I have any parting thoughts? Just about anything? Anything. The (laughs) mic is yours. Well, it's just so nice to talk to you in person. And I think when you go through a similar situation, that's like pretty rare. Like, who else am I talking to this about? You understand the disease we went through together, really. Um, well, not together, but now we can go through it together. And when you're so in much, it, it's actually quite so is- like yeah. very isolating. It's very isolating because people don't understand what it is. And right. And you're in go, go mode. Yeah. Right. And when you have kids and your mom and, you know, you start to – you get older and you just see life so differently. Like, yes. whoa, um, you know – you really think about mortality, think about how can I like try to be the healthiest I can so that I'm here the longest and I have the the longest health span. I'm reading this book now and it's it talks about health span, not lifespan. Like how do you live the longest without disease and disability? Because that's really what matters. You can live a really long life, but if you're sick during it, that's not, not what a great we quality. want. We want quality of life. What's the book called? It's called Outlive. Okay. And are we liking it? Yeah. I mean, it's big and it's a little technical. Okay. <laughs> I'm not a reader, but I'm trying. I love like, I love science-y books. Yeah. But sometimes I don't really understand them. So I'm thinking, how can other people really understand What this? about Audible? Because I come from a scientific background. Yeah. I, I mean, I would do that too, but there's something about holding a book. That you're in into? And just flipping the pages that people don't do anymore. I, I like, like a that. combo. 
I love Audible on the go, but I yeah. love books beachside. But uh, also the book you're talking about, like, might be a little too technical. I once Right. Took- I was thinking about listening to it, and, I, and I'm not sure. I need to almost visually see it. To like pro- I read things over and over. Especially so I'm like, what words. did that mean? Yeah. The scientific words. Yeah. Also, I made the mistake once of reading um, Sicker, Fatter, Poorer. I brought it with me oh, to Anguilla, yeah. and I was, like, fascinated by it. But also, like, why was I reading that yeah. on vacation? They're it depressing. Was so depressing and fascinating, right. but really depressing. Mm-hmm. Anyway, a lot of learnings along the way. And so there's a time and a place even for books, aren't there? Yeah. Right? Love a book, but I love a podcast. I love listening to things. I, I think we're so lucky we have all this information now, but it can be very overwhelming, <laughs> which is a huge part of my job is just like is disseminating all this education, but then doing the opposite and like taking all the misinformation and, you know, giving you the truth about it because there's the, too much misinformation. What's the biggest p- piece of – what is the biggest piece of misinformation – that oh, pisses you off in nutrition. <laughs> There's so many things. It's like singling out foods. This food's going to improve your life and this food is not is going to, you know, deter from your life. It, it's give look an example. at the big picture. Well, oh, gosh. If you don't mind. A huge topic right now is seed oils. Have you been seeing this? Seed oils like like canola oil and sunflower oil and everything you know, except olive oil and avocado oil. So people are demonizing seed oils and like chips and stuff. Okay. Right. I've heard this about canola oil. Yeah. But like, um, I was, I was responding to some article the other day cause I do like media work and, and someone was asking me about seed oils and inflammation because yeah. this is what the topic is. And I said, I once had a client who was drinking like half a bottle of wine every day and smoking cigarettes and was very upset about seed oil. Should I be eating them or not? And I said, first, cut back or stop smoking and drinking so much. And then when your diet's much better, and your lifestyle's much better, then I would focus more on the specifics, like focusing on better oils right, that are right. less inflammatory. Because it's like, look at the whole picture. Don't like single things out. Like right. this protein powder is going to change your life or this, you know, diet is going to, um, you know, help you lose 20 pounds in two weeks. It's just all a bunch of bullshit. <laughs> it's all like it's so much of it's bullshit that it's like get back to the basics. Like start to eat real foods that come from the outside, the tree, the bush. Um, start to move your body every day in some way. Yeah. Hydrate. Work on your stress level and your quality of sleep. These are the things that are going to help prolong your life, not, you know, avoiding or including one food or another. Right. Start with the big stuff mm-hmm. and then make sure, right, that you are buying your oils based on the heat point you want to cook them at, right? Yeah, things like okay, that. Okay, fine. Or, yeah. But get there when you get there. Yeah. Or eggs is like a topic I'll never. I love eggs. Yeah. Eggs have been demonized. <sighs> from back in the day, but it's sugar. It's not eggs. Sugar is the problem. We have such an overload of added sugar in our diet. Eggs are a beautiful food that are not going to raise your blood sugar at all. And they have so much choline in them, right? Brain power. They're so good for you. They're one of the most perfect foods and everyone has them in their house usually. Yes. And they're economical and they're versatile, but we demonize eggs and say they're going to raise our cholesterol. It's not true. But so many little, like, people like to cherry pick from articles, and that's how this, these things get into our heads. Right. When it's not true. Well, I so appreciate you <laughs> debunking some of the misinformation around nutrition. Of course. I and could do it forever. I love that. I probably will. And I also want to thank you for sharing so deeply about your experience with your dad. Mm-hmm. And I'm my heart goes out to you. You too. For your loss, I, I I get it, and it's so hard. And um, just know that I will never ask you if you have found closure. I will never ask that because I don't think closure is possible. No. So I appreciate that you know that without me even having to say it. Of course. And um, for just being it's here part today of life and always. Too. It is. I know. And this we is something what's that part of life we now. have to start talking more about in <laughs> right. life is grief yeah, and death. And it's mm-hmm. so scary. But nobody that we see on the street today 
will very likely be alive in 100 years from now unless they have some crazy new scientific advancement. Right. I don't know. The things I think about now are so different than before. So different. Exactly. Thank you so much, Laura. You're so welcome. 